Well, that was read now for, I believe it was the third time we've been reading verses 1 to 13 at least. So I promise that after this Sunday, we'll be moving on to verse 14. Uh, so I think we're in 1 to 4, 13 for about four weeks. And so I have, uh, there was a lot there, so I felt really needed to make sure it was covered. And so I, I think we've done that uh, with the inclusion of today's message. So I feel comfortable at that point moving on from there. So, um, if you notice throughout Scripture, there are many illustrations um, that have an agrarian, uh, farming, um, uh, horticultural uh, significance or background to it. If you ever notice that, maybe that's uh, maybe it's because the illustrations work. Maybe it's because the biblical writers were around. Farming a lot were around horticulture and biology, often as they were uh, very close to the food production as it was grown. Uh, maybe it's just because uh, it is biology, and so as we consider uh, our creation, God's creation of us, uh, so we consider what God was doing in, in the realms of uh, growth and vegetation, all that kind of stuff. And so we see a lot of that. In Romans 11, we see that. Uh, we were grafted into the olive branch, which is Christ. Uh, and that is taking that, uh, remember that, that propagation uh, from one plant or one uh, source to another. And so, uh, if I was to continue that uh, horticultural illustration and metaphorical language uh, to explain this passage, especially Romans uh, 6.4, I could explain it in such a way where um, if a seed falls to the ground, it has to die in order to produce another tree. Okay? So if a seed were to fall on the ground, the very purpose of it falling onto the ground is that it might die so that in its death, another tree or plant is, is produced or is given life. Now, if at any point in time that seed fails to fall to the ground, it's hanging on because it doesn't want to die, or some bird picks it up before it has a time, chance to die, then that tree or that other plant will fail to grow. So in a similar way, we see the death of Christ being necessary in order for the resurrection of Christ to happen. Jesus would not have resurrected had he not died. It's pretty simple. And as, as we looked at a couple weeks ago, the, one of the major foundational doctrines in Christianity, in biblical doctrines, is that of our union with Christ, being united with Christ, being placed in Christ. And so just as Christ died, so too did we symbolically and spiritually die with him. And just as he rose, we symbolically and spiritually rose with him. As he died, we died with him. As he rose from the dead, we too rose from the dead. And that was necessary for the death to take place in order for there to be life. And so there cannot be spiritual life unless spiritual death takes place first. Unless we die with Christ, we cannot live with Christ. And as we look at this passage today, uh, in Romans 6, 4, so go ahead and turn with me, open it up. There is one major caveat there that is extremely important for us to understand. That I think is, um, is not looked at enough in its significance. Romans 6, 4. Paul writes this, page 942 of the uh, Pew Bible. I cannot say Pew Bible instead of Chile. <coughs> not that that's, that's significant. Just saying. <laughs> we were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Did you see that? Did you see what I saw? Maybe not, because it took me about three weeks to see it, so you might not have gotten a chance to see it, but if you were looking carefully, you saw what I saw. And if what you're seeing is what I saw, you're seeing that the reason for our spiritual death was so that we might walk in newness of life. Did you see it? It's there. That we were buried with him by baptism into death, which I explained the last week before, in order that, so that, just as Jesus was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, 
right here, we too might walk in newness of life. Did you see it? We died for purpose. See, the way he phrased it is very, is very interesting. He could have said, we died with Christ, and we also was raised with Christ. We were raised with Christ. Or he could have said, we died with Christ, and as a result, we walk in newness of life. He didn't say that. He didn't say that we died with Christ, and as a result, we walk in newness of life, because the newness of life is a qualifier for the death. In other words, the very purpose of dying with Christ okay, was so that you and I can walk in newness of life. Did you see it now? It's a very important caveat. It's very important to understand that the very purpose of, of dying with Christ was so that, not that you might have a relationship with Christ, although that's part of it, not that you might have uh, a different eternal destination, although that's part of it, the very purpose of dying with Christ was so that you and I might walk in newness of life. There's a huge difference. See, imagine, uh, imagine Moses was to buy me a brand new bike. And she bought me this brand new bike, and she said, this is a brand new bike that I just bought you. I said, thank you for the brand new bike. It's a lovely, beautiful, great bike. And I'm just going to hang it up in the garage and look at it every time I go into the garage. Thank you very much. You say, well, Brad, you're not know, getting the point. You're not know, getting the purpose. Right? The purpose of the brand new bike is so that you might ride it. He said, no, 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 I just want to look at it. Well, then I could have gotten a lot cheaper bike. Right? So the very purpose of, of, of having the bike and owning the bike is so that I might ride it. And that's similar to what we see here. See, in this passage, in that verse alone, there are two things happening. And I'm getting a lot of echo up here. I don't know if you guys are. Uh, uh, there you go. There are two things happening. First off, you are receiving something. Okay? You're receiving what? Newness of life. So according to Romans 6, 4, two things happen. You receive newness of life. So there's something received. So there's, in the illustration, there's something I received, and that was a brand new bike. I didn't receive a brand new bike. But in the illustration, I received a brand new bike. And the second thing is an action to act with. And that was to walk in newness of life. So if I were to receive a brand new bike, the very purpose was so that I might ride it. So there are two things that we see here, two uh, two points, two points I'm going to end up making today. And that was the thing received, which was uh, a newness of life, and the action of walking in newness of life, living in newness of life, having your state of being, your existence altered in a dramatically spiritual way where you are now walking in a new life, whereas before, had you not died with Christ, you would not be walking in that newness with Christ. So today, we just want to look at those two things. And that is first, the newness of life, and second, walking in it. That's the two points. Now, what I thought, in order for us to understand newness, we need to understand exactly, we need to see examples of how God has created newness or what, what aspects of that newness. Because you and I can talk about and marvel in the newness of life to a blue in the face. But it doesn't mean anything unless we identify what elements that newness uh, involves. So I thought, okay. God's MO has always been the same. He's a God of newness, isn't he? So it might help us to understand. So Romans 6.4 is actually going to act as very much a, a, a springboard, a launching path into these other verses so that we might see what the, any, some examples of what newness of life look like. The newness of life given by God. So there are six different times in Scripture that we see God doing something new, giving newness, specifically giving newness to his saints. A newness of some sort. So your question and my question should be, what does that newness look like so that I might identify that newness so that I might know how better to walk in it? God is a God of newness. You see that in Scripture. God is a God of newness. In fact, the Bible starts with God creating something new. In fact, what's even, even neater than that 
But even more interesting than that, he starts with something new and he ends with something new. In other words, he, he starts with creation, uh, bringing something into existence, but then we see man's rebellion, we mess everything up, we see the story of redemption, but at the very end, in Revelation 22, we see God creating a new heaven and earth. So what does that tell you? That tells you if God's communication to us is bookended by his creating something new, that should tell you that God is a God of newness. And he creates newness, and when that newness goes wrong and goes bad on account of sin, then he renews that newly created heaven and earth. The new heaven and earth. We see in Ezekiel 37, God takes Israel, uh, Ezekiel in, a, in, a, in some kind of uh, spiritual uh, picture where he brings him to the desert and in this desert he says, Ezekiel, what do you see? He says, I see nothing but dead man's bones that have been bleached by the sun. They're dry bones. He says, these bones are going to be the nation of Israel and they, they represent the nation of Israel. And then as you see this, this is the nation of Israel right now, but soon I am going to create something new here. I am going to create a new nation. And sure enough, we see at that point in time in Ezekiel where, where he was prophesying to a nation that was dead, spiritually dead, uh, economically dead, where God started to raise something up new, which we see continuing today. We see Lazarus. Jesus telling Lazarus to come forth from the grave. He was dead, and Jesus brought newness of life to Lazarus. So we see, we see this MO with God, don't we? This newness of life, this, this newness that God does. So, so there's six other uh, uh, examples that I'm going to quickly look at. I'm going to get a quick look if I can't exhaust to each one of them as though I, I want to. Uh, so we're going to look at them. So the first thing we see, if you're taking notes, this is the first one. The first new thing we see God doing is creating in us a new song. A new song. Go to Psalms 40, verse 3. Psalms 40, verse 3. Flip back. We're gonna, we're gonna exercise your, your scripture flipping quite a bit here. The 468, if you have a, a pew Bible, then a black Bible. Psalms 40, verse 3. You see this about six different times in the book of Psalms, uh, many of which are from David. David writes this, and many of you may have heard this. Uh, I think there are a couple of songs uh, that were done in relation to this. He put this, he, God put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. So what's he talking about? Is he talking about uh, 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 bars and measures and, and uh, 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 trouble clefts and this and that, flats? And, uh, is he talking about uh, songs? Or is he talking about a, uh, something to give him hope. Because he's talking, talking about a life's theme song. He's talking about a life's theme song. He's talking about a life's theme song. God has given me a new song to sing. See, a theme song is what takes, it, oftentimes in a movie or in a show, you'll have a theme song. Okay? Growing up, uh, you probably know by heart those theme songs, and you could probably still sing them today. We used to watch Beverly Hillbillies. I could sing the entire theme song of the Beverly Hillbillies too. What theme songs do, I won't, I won't. What theme songs do is they take the, 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 the narrative as a whole and they produce a song with it that as you listen to that song, you listen to the narrative set to music so you understand what is happening in the show or what is happening in the movie. Because it is in that song that it summarizes the, the, the show in its entirety, the movie in its entirety, the narrative in its entirety. So what David is saying is that God has given me a new song that, that summarizes my, the narrative of my life. Notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say what you and I would have written down. He doesn't say what the world says. He doesn't say that God gave me a reason to sing. You notice that? You didn't notice it because it wasn't there. But he, he, he didn't say that God now has given me a new reason to sing. That would have made sense to us. We would have gotten that. Why? 
Because as humans, fallen humans, we're constantly after altering our circumstances, aren't we? We're constantly seeking to have our circumstances altered. And that is, as long as my circumstances are changed, I've been given a reason to sing. So in other words, God, I thank you for changing my circumstances. Now I have a reason to sing. In other words, I wouldn't have had a reason to sing had my circumstances not changed. But now that you changed them, I thank you, and now I have a reason to sing. He didn't sing that at all. In other words, God gave him a new song to sing completely. His life was changed. His life was altered. Did you get that? The narrative of the, the, the summary of the, the narrative of his life has changed drastically. And that song is a song of redemption. That is the song that our lives sing. As saints of God, the song that our lives sing is a song of redemption. That's what it's about. If you ask me, Brad, what's the theme song of your life about? It's not about uh, Jed. Uh, striking oil, becoming rich, and moving to Beverly Hills. That's not what it's about. The narrative of my life, Beverly Hills, Billy, uh, the narrative of my life is the song of redemption. That God placed me here. I rebelled from God. I sought God. I re God redeemed me, saved me, called me, justified me, did all that work. Created me a newness of life. That's my song. And that's what they say. So God has given us a new song. A new summary of the narrative of our life. He's also given us a new strength. Go to Isaiah 40, verse 31. Isaiah 40, 31. He's given us a new strength. He's given the saints a new strength. Isaiah 40, verse 31. Page 600 of the Pew Bible there. It says, But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And the ESV captain does a good job of capturing the essence of that. But what it doesn't capture in English is that the source of that renewed strength is God. In other words, the, the Israelites weren't in a state of, of disrepair, weren't in a state of a downtrodden state, and they renewed their own strength. No, no, no. That strength was renewed, was given anew by God. Israel at this point in time, when Isaiah was writing this, was in a, a state half of the nation was taken captive by the Assyrians. The other nation, the other set, half of the nation, Judah, Judah. So Israel, the top, the, the northern section was taken captive. The southern section, Judah, was about to be taken captive. They were in a state of mental and emotional uh, grief. And they needed encouragement. They needed uplifting. And so what God says is they needed strength. That, that What Isaiah is saying is, God, those who wait patiently for the Lord, that strength is being given to them anew. They're receiving strength that they would not have had had God not given it to them. Right? It doesn't necessarily mean that God always changes the circumstances. Sometimes he does, but oftentimes he doesn't. One of the reasons he didn't hear because uh, what we don't see right now is that Israel's in a state of discipline right now. So God's not going to change it. But what he's going to do for them, given their situation, is that he's going to give them the medal. Uh, and, and fortitude to overcome. Metal, M-E-T-T-L-E. -E, and fortitude that they need, the strength that they need to overcome. That should be an encouraging factor. Now that, many of you probably know already. If I were to say that God gives you strength, you'd say, yeah, I know that. So the bigger question is, how does God give us strength? That's the question I would want to know. If I have a situation of, of discouragement, downtroddenness, I would want to know how it is that God's going to give me that strength. Where is this supernatural, spiritual strength? How is it going to come? Well, I'll give you the, the non-sensational answer, the very practical answer, and that the super, supernatural, spiritual strength comes from His Word, comes from His saints, comes from the Holy Spirit. 
that is a non-sensational but yet very practical answer to how God gives strength. He gives it through His Spirit. He gives it through His saints. And he gives it through His Word. That is why uh, when Paul actually in Philippians 4, 430 I believe, 4 something, where Paul says, I can, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Right? There's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, athletes, a lot of individuals that take that completely out of context. I can, I can do this. I can overcome this by God and Christ's strength. Right? I can beat up that person or I can hit that home run by Christ giving me that strength. I hate to burst their bubble. That's not what Paul's talking about. I don't think. And what he actually says right after that is one of the, the sources of encouragement that he received was this, uh, the source of help from the Philippians and themselves. He says, I've learned to be content. God's given me the strength. And what he follows that up with is he, he thanks the, the, the Philippians for their encouragement and their strength that he received that strength through the saints. It's for that reason, saints. It's for that reason, Christians, that we need to be constantly in his word. We need to be constantly in fellowship with the saints. We need to be constantly uh, requesting God's spirit to minister to us. We need to be here. We need to be fellowship in, 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 in our shape groups, in our DLD groups, in our, our root groups, in our Bible study groups, and in all these small groups to be fellowshipping with other people, giving them that opportunity to bear our burdens, to be in prayer, asking God that his spirit would renew us and give us a strength. It is a preemptive uh, uh, strength that he gives us. In other words, it may, may not be that you need it now, but as you continue to engage the saints, as you continue to, to, to uh, in, uh, immerse yourself in God's word, as you continue to request the strength of the Holy Spirit, little by little, day by day, that builds up the metal that you need. That builds up the fortitude that you need. It's that consistency. It's a consistency that you and I need to be in. Nothing drastic is going to happen on any one given Sunday, necessarily. Right? It's not that we, 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 we kind of uh, stand on the sidelines, failing to engage with any other believers, failing to engage in, in the body, the assembly of the body of saints. And we come for once and we're expecting, okay, that'll fill me up until the next, for the next month or so. That's not how it happens. It happens through consistency. It happens through consistency in God's Word. Being here right now in worship, in fellowship, throughout the week, in prayer. That's how it happens. That's how that metal is produced. Now I wish I could give you uh, another more sensational answer, but that's how it happened. Now, growing up, this will seem like an odd illustration. It might be. I might regret it afterwards, but I'll tell you anyways. See, uh, I have... I have a weak stomach, or I have a dry skin. Okay. Anybody that knows me well knows Brad's stomach is just a, a cream puff of a stomach. And I, Brad has dry skin. I do, I got dry skin. And, and if I go away, especially in the winter, it's dry. If I go a, a while without putting any kind of lotion on, that's right, I use lotion. I'm afraid to admit it. Uh, lotion or special soap or this or that, it's going to get dry and my hands are going to hurt. But I notice that if I do it on a regular basis, if I use head and shoulders on a regular basis, if I use a special kind of soap, special kind of lotion on a regular basis, my hands feel nice and creamy. So <laughs> then right now, they're actually pretty dry. Okay? I think it's because I'm thinking about it. But it takes that regular, <coughs> that, that regular discipline of doing it. Now, I might regret that illustration later. I probably will. But it, hopefully, you get the idea. Okay, that's how my strength is given. So God gives us a new song, He gives us a new strength, and He gives us, in Isaiah 43, 18 and 19, He gives us a new season. Turn with me, Isaiah 43, just a couple pages over, 18 and 19. He often kind of gives us a new season in life. Page 604, remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. What an encouraging verse that would have been to the Israelites. Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Verse 19, behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth, do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. 
There are two things to talk about. Again, they were in a time of national decline. He says, that decline won't always be. I'm doing something new. And for the spirit of the same, you may not perceive it, but God is doing something. In our lives, when we came to him initially, God created something completely brand new, a new season in life. And for the Israelites here, if you look at uh, verse 25, it talks about their sins. It talks about them coming to repentance. Verse 25 says, I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. In other words, stop looking behind you. Stop looking at the past rebellion. There's been repentance. There's been confession. Stop now looking. I have chosen to forget that. Do you think God, being omniscient, forgets it and really forgets it? No. He chooses to forget it. He chooses to dismiss it completely. Why? So that we are not caught up in our past, that we might embrace and appreciate the completely new season that He has given us. What a glory. What a wonderful picture to glory in. That yes, that was my season, but that is no longer my season. My season has been made brand new. Because that's what God does. That's what God does in the life of a believer. When we come to Christ, He makes it new. And where there has been sin, when we come back to Him in repentance, He says, you've repented. At no point in time, He says, you've repented. Uh, and I forgive you, but I'm going to take note of that for quite a while. You're going to be in a, in a uh, kind of a, um, a holding pattern. You're going to be kind of in a, uh, uh, a time of testing. We'll see how you do. Okay, Kind of a probationary time. You're, you're going to be there for a little while. No, he doesn't say that. He says, no, okay, good. You've come to me in repentance. Now it's something new. Now it's a, a clean slate. What, more, what could be more encouraging than that? What could be more encouraging than that? It says a new song, a new strength, a new season, a new name. He says he gives us a new name. Now, as many of you know, Wilson and I are expecting our other one. Okay? At this point in time, it doesn't really matter. We've got one more coming. And, and to be quite honest, uh, when we go to naming the child, okay, it really, we, we go with what sounds good. Okay? I won't lie. Uh, and unfortunately, that's where we have dumb names like Apple and Sirius and some of these other weird names and actors and actresses name their kids. I guess it sounds good to them, all right? But I, I can't really fault them that much because we really kind of go with what sounds good for us, too. What kind of what kind of goes well with Lucas learning and Amelia? What goes well with a lot? What goes well with this? Does it translate well in French and English? That, that's the only Quebec thing. And only up here do we do that. Can they say it in both languages? And so 75% of it, is, it, it, it persuades us on that. Now, we'd like to, to, to uh, honor you know, family members and keep a name in the family, but if it sounds just horrible, we're probably not going to name it. Unlike the East, and, and most families, most couples do the exact same thing. Okay? No more noble or honorable notes. They go on with what sounds good. Okay? Now, not so with more of the Eastern mindset. See, the Eastern context, the Eastern, Eastern culture, Names a child based on a perceived character or an anticipated character. Okay, that if I want my child to grow up, um, I don't know, dancing with wolves, I'll name him dancing with wolves. Or maybe from the 90s, dancing with wolves. Yeah. And so, or, or there's something else. Right? We see constantly throughout Scripture. That's why we see God changing the name. And God, God uh, 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 plays out that cultural custom that the Israelites would have known. And that's why he changes names, isn't he? He changed Abram to what? Abraham, the father of nations. He changed Jacob to Israel. He was doing something there. He changed Saul to Paul. He changes names. Why? Why names? Because a name is a depiction of an identity. A name really dictates a person's identity in some way. If you, were to just, if you knew me and you were trying to describe it to somebody, and you who may or may not know me, you say, okay, Brad, he's about 5'9", dark hair, uh, between the age of 25, 20, right? <laughs> 45, I don't know where you're going. So, uh, have you seen this guy? Right? Dark hair, it, it is 25 to 45, 
Uh, five guys. You ever seen that guy? Yeah, I've seen like a hundred of them on the street. No, or you could say, uh, his name is Brad Millett. And if they knew my name, if they knew him, they'd say, oh, I know who you're talking about. Yeah. Why? Because my name identifies me. So, so for the same reason, we see God giving Israel a new name. If you look at it in Isaiah 62, 2. This is such a neat passage, especially understanding the cultural context here for Israel. In Isaiah 62, 2, 621, it says, The nations shall see your righteousness, and all the kings your glory. You shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. See, in verses 4 and 5, we see that their name kind of symbolically was forsaken and desolate. So as other nations looked at the Israelites and said, look at that forsaken nation, forsaken by their God, and this desolate nation that has come to, to nothing. He says, not anymore. I'm about to give you a new name that will dictate your identity. And that new name, it says in verse 5, is, uh, sorry, verse um, 4, goes from forsaken and desolate to my delight is in her. And your land married. So my delight is in her. Sounds like a racing horse name. But so you're going to be named my delight is in her and married. All of a sudden their name can change. And, and this name says everything now about their relationship with God, doesn't it? It says everything about their relationship with God. No, they're not desolate anymore. They're not forsaken. I'm doing something new. And with this newness comes a brand new name. Now you're not going to be called forsaken and desolate. Now you're going to be called my delight is in her. And now you're going to be called Mary, married to God. Now when people look at you, they're going to see that God did not forsake you. You are no longer desolate. He's doing something new and he's giving you a new name. That's why we have the name Saint. It means holy one. It means that we've been imputed with the holiness of God. It doesn't mean we walk around as superheroes by any stretch of the imagination, but it means that we have been identified with Christ and God sees us as holy. And we may not act like it from time to time. God sees us as holy and calls us saint. That name was never meant to have been some canonized name for some super saint. For some super Christian, no, no, no. That was meant for the marginalized, for the destitute, for the, the imperfect saint, the imperfect Christian, you and I. So God, is, we, we were of that, but not anymore. God calls us saint. God calls us his holy ones. So a new song. We have new strength, a new season, a new name, a new compassion. New compassion. If you ever read the book of Lamentations, it's a wonderful book. It's a book of lamentation. It's a book of lamenting, where Jeremiah is lamenting. But it peppered throughout it is praise. If you've ever read through the Psalms and some of the, the, the Lamentation Psalms, David was, was, was really good at this. He would write these songs of Lamentation. Psalm 79 is a good picture of it. Uh, 20 plus verses are dedicated to lament, lamenting their fact, uh, lamenting their situation. But in the end, he says, we will forever praise the Lord for the next generation, the next generation. We will praise the Lord. And that's why lamentation is a beautiful picture of the same song. Because yes, we lament, but we, 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 we praise the Lord in the midst of that lamentation. And so in Lamentations 3.24, he says that God gives us new compassions every day. Flip over quickly after Isaiah Jeremiah and Lamentations, page 688, 323 uh, uh, and 24, new compassions. This is what God does. In this newness of life, there's new compassions. I should go to verse 22 and 24, sorry. Verse 22, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They're unending. They're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. They're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. There isn't a day that goes by where God, is not, His mercy and His compassion, His faithfulness are not ready to minister to us. 
No matter what the situation, there isn't a single day that starts where His new mercies and His new compassions, His faithfulness, are not the ready to minister to us. What a thought. What a thought. And as you know, uh, uh, Lauren, our second, was, was at a council taken out the first time they were being back. So for two weeks, she was in pain. For two weeks. And as her parents, are, is, uh, although we were tired, we were always ready with compassion for her. Are you on ice cream? Sure. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. That's going to help you get your medication? Sure. Take it. Popsicles? Sure. Hugs? Sure. Kisses? Sure. We were always ready with willing compassion. That's what a loving parent does. Even though we didn't want to. Can't say I right. well, wanted to. You can't say I was ready at 2 o'clock in the morning to jump out of bed and, and hug her because she was crying. And couldn't console her. wasn't frustrated. We were always ready. That's the compassion of God daily. Always ready. Always ready. Every morning I do the exact same thing. I'm ready then? I get up. I walk downstairs. Before I do anything, I get the coffee going. <laughs> Every single morning, it's the same thing. Every single morning, I fill my mug up with a brand new cup of coffee. That's what Jeremiah said. Every single morning. New compassions. Our cups are filled with new compassion, new mercies, ready. So you might wake up saying, I don't even need any compassion. I feel pretty good. Oh, it's ready. It's ready. Because chances are it's going to come. Every single morning, it comes. His compassion, his mercies come, and they're ready. And finally, this newness of life, after new compassions, we see a new spirit. God has given us a new spirit. He's given us a new spirit. Ezekiel 11, 19. Ezekiel 11, 19. The prophet writes this. Page 699. And I will give them one heart and a new spirit I will put within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. That they may walk in my statutes and keep my rules and obey them. They shall be my people and I will be their God. He's talking about something that they have no idea exists yet. He's talking about the, uh, uh, at one point, at the coming of Christ when the Spirit of God is unleashed on man. We see that at Pentecost. We see that there would be a time for the nation of Israel that, that they would be filled with a new spirit that would come to a culmination of the millennial reign of Christ we see in the Revelation. God is a God of newness. Now, he has given us this newness. So in this life of newness, well, 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 what does this life, new, newness of love life consist of? It consists of a new song. It consists of new strength. It consists of a new season. It consists of a new name, of new mercies and compassions, and a new spirit. This newness of life, that's what it consists of. How then do we walk in it? After we have died and are ready to walk in this life, what does that look like? I'll just spend a minute on this one. See, when somebody, uh, it should give us a new lease on life. When somebody is confronted by death, now, oftentimes when you hear somebody talking, generally speaking, when somebody talks about, I, I have a new lease on life now, what has just happened? They've been confronted by death through something. Either they, they got in an accident, they almost died, and so now they have a new lease on life, you might say. Or, or someone loved one has just died and they sat through the funeral, so all of a sudden the reality of life has come uh, barging into their life and has knocked them upside the head, so now they have a new lease on life, they would say. For the Christian, it's not that we've been confronted with death, it is that we have died with Christ, which should produce a new lease on life. Imagine you're Lazarus. Imagine you're Lazarus and you die. And now you've just risen from the dead. Jesus, the Son of God, God Himself, has come, raised you from the dead. Are you going to tell me that you're going to wake up doing the exact same thing you did the, the day before? You're going to tell me that you're, doing your, you're, you're not going to have a new lease on life? You're not going to tell me that things are going to be a little bit differently? Yeah, they are. You're going to have a new song, you're going to sing. You're going to have a, a brand new lease on life. Given this newness of life. So it really looks like this. It looks like the, the, this walking in newness is doing so in light of the new song that God has given you, the new strength that God gives you every day, the new season in life, 
the new name, the new compassions, the new spirit. It is living in light of that. It is living in light of that newness. And second, I'll say this, in closing with this. In Colossians 3, Paul talks about this newness of life actually being renewed. Colossians 3, verse 8 to 10, page 984. Colossians 3, verse 8 to 10. But now you must put them all away as a, the earthly passions of life. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self of its practices. So you put off the old self and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. So this newness of life is actually renewed. How? It is renewed in the knowledge of our creator. We were created in this image. This new life is renewed as we gain all the more, more knowledge of our God. We gain a greater intimacy with Him. And this new life is renewed. Now, for, for my relationship with my wife, I know my wife well, very well. Better than anybody else, possibly even better than she knows herself and vice versa. And the more I know of her, the more intimate our relationship is. Why? Because all of a sudden I know her more and more and more, and as a result, the intimacy and the fellowship that we have grows more and more and more. It comes with the knowledge of one another. And so it goes that as we know and grow in the knowledge of our Creator, our new life is renewed day by day. There's an intimacy with God that it grows and expands as we know Him more. You and I were called to die so that we might walk in newness of life, in light of our own sins, growing and gaining a greater and greater knowledge of the glory of God so that we might live in a greater intimacy with Him and know Him better. We were, we, were, we were given the students of life not to have this relationship that we might walk with Christ, but rather to walk in newness, united with Christ. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, hammer that thought home in our lives. Hammer that thought home in our psyche, in our, our mental aptitude, in our mental capacity. May you constantly remind us of the newness of life that you have brought us. And may we grow in the knowledge of you that our newness of life might be renewed every day. May us all these things and praise you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.